freaking first cut. Golly! Welcome to the First Cut Podcast. I'm Rick Gaiman, and this is your day two recap for this week's WGC Dell Technologies match play. Joining me to break it all down, Mark Immelman is here. Hey, Mark. How's it, Rick? How are you doing, bro? I'm well. How about yourself? I'm all good. Thank you very much. Uh, going on vacation to uh, the Virgin U.S. Virgin Islands tomorrow morning, so looking forward to a few days away. All right. We've got one last podcast out of you before you get going. Uh-huh. So we're going to make the most of it. And we're not going to start with the match play because there's a notable name still very much listed on the Masters website. And Mark, that name that I'm obviously referring to is one Tiger Woods. Now, this became apparent to everyone when Phil Mickelson's name was listed on the website as past champions, not competing yet underneath the competitors section that man in red and black right there tiger woods if you're watching on youtube now mark i i want to be excited about this i want this to be true i want nothing more in the world but to see tiger woods tee it up at augusta national but maybe we should pump the brakes about what's on the website here yeah i would slow down a little bit but you know you and me and everyone else and the world of golf would love to see him tee it up in August, in April at Augusta National. Um, that would be miraculous. It honestly would. I mean, the Tiger Woods that I saw here recently playing um, still look very, you know, ginger in the way he was walking. The golf swing looks okay, but it's a long week and it's a grueling golf course to walk. And then you get one or two uh, early morning. Well, he doesn't really go that early morning, but you'll still have a morning time when there might be some dew on the grass and that place gets slippery. So I don't know if he plays that, that would be a miracle. It truly would. I sort of foresaw, foresee whatever the word is. I foresee him coming back at the open championship at St. Andrews, but if he makes it in April, well, awesome. I mean, our ratings will be bananas, which is a good deal. <laughs> and everyone will be having a grand old time with it. And I think, you know, in a strange sort of a way, now that I talk about this, Rick, the one thing the masters to me, amongst many things, the one thing it represents is kind of new beginnings Mm -hmm. because it's springtime and, you know, you're out of the winter and you're out of the cold and dark and wet and that sort of thing into, you know, green and spring and warm and and new beginnings. So maybe this is a new beginning. Who knows? Maybe there's a little uh, metaphorical parity there or something. Certainly holding thumbs for that outcome here, Mark. Now, I guess the official stance of this is Tiger obviously uh, well more than qualified for for this event for the rest of his life. So he is still active. Uh, Now, a normal PGA Tour event, he would have until the Friday before to kind of commit and make sure he's still in the field. Is that kind of the same situation that we have going on with with the Masters? Honestly, I'd be lying if I gave you an answer. I, I would think so. I would think you have till 5 p.m. Friday afternoon, right. like in regular That's events, that it is. Yeah. time to commit. So, yeah, I mean, uh, I speak under correction, but I do believe that is still the case. So uh, we, we'll wait and see for August the, the 1st or 2nd or whatever. Uh, not August, April the f- 1st, I think it is, maybe. We will definitely find out before August 1st. Yes, April <laughs> April 1st. And Jacob will let us know because he's been furiously clicking the refresh button on the Masters website every two minutes for the last couple of days. Uh, Holt let us know. Uh, match play this week. Mark, a full day of golf for the second day in a row. How are you enjoying all of these matches that last all day long? I'm loving it. Um, look, it's a great golf course. Match play is a fun format to watch. Uh, it's a nice field. There have been some intriguing games. And... And so, yeah, I've really had a good time with it. And I've loved the way the course is played. With a little wind, you know, the greens are firm enough where you have to be able to play the bounce and the roll and you have to factor for that when you're making club calls and stuff. So it's been thoroughly entertaining from my point of view. A couple of notables here. Uh, Seamus Power, who Kyle and I spoke with, uh, spoke about last night. He has um, accepted affiliate membership onto the DP World Tour. So he's trying to make himself Ryder Cup eligible. And he has uh, smoked Patrick Cantlay here on day two, five and four, which by my math, Mark, that eliminates Patrick Cantlay. There is not a path for him to move on. That's unfortunate for my bracket, but Seamus Power uh, certainly rolling at the moment. Well, I mean, the Euros really were rolling. I quickly counted through the names who won, and get this, Ram, Lowry, Westwood, Bland, Hovland's up, 
with a, a couple of, you might have closed it out by now already Just at the time did. of recording. Yep. Yep. So Hovland wins. You mentioned Power, Tyrrell Hatton won, Tommy Fleetwood won, Matt Fitzpatrick won, Justin Rose won. Sergio got a half. Uh, I think the only folks who lost was maybe Thomas Peters and one other. So it, it just speaks to match play for me. Uh, it speaks to the fact that you've got to play a lot of match play to really understand the vagaries of it. Um, you heard Lee Westwood maybe after his uh, his big victory over Bryson, he came back and beat DeChambeau, where he was asked about this. And he said, look, I've played match play since I was a kid. It's kind of all we play over there in, in England. And it's the same thing with a lot of internationals. So uh, it's it's an acquired taste, if you will. And you've got to understand how to play the game because you go from 72-hole stroke play where it's just you and you're singular, singular and you're playing your ball. And now you've got to think about somebody else who might be all over the joint. I mean, we saw Jordan Spieth make the most stupid par in the world ever today on the 11th. Mm -hmm. um, and that sort of stuff can get under your skin if, you, if you're flushing down the middle every single time and onto the green and some guys doing all sorts of he heroics to, to keep the match tight. So, um, yeah, it was a big win for power. He's a beautiful player, though, and he's proved it here in the West Coast swing. He's strong and he, he not that long, but he hits it heavy. And so the ball cuts through the wind. So conditions like this where it was windy, it would have played right into his alley. And then you factor the fact that it's match play, then, you know, that's two checks in his, uh, in his plus column. Yeah, speaking of successes from a uh, European player, Sergio Garcia looked to be uh, done with when they stepped to the 14th tee in his match against Colin Morikawa. He wins uh, the 14th hole. He wins the 15th hole. He wins the 16th hole to earn a half a point. And that's kind of the match play thing, Mark. You're, you're, you're never really out of it. You can kind of go on these runs. And earning a half a point on day two is incredibly valuable for your chance is when you're only playing three matches before you get out of the group stage. You know, it certainly is. And and I attribute some of that to the golf course and how it lays out. Um, you know, 10's an easy-ish hole over a hill. You'll have a short club in there. 11's a difficult par three. But then you've got 12, which is a reachable five. You can see anything from three through seven over there. And then you've got 13, drivable. Then 14's a beast. But then 15 is a difficult-ish par four. But then you've got 16 of five, 17, a nice three and 18, you know, anything can happen. So if you get it going on and you turn the momentum quick, you can see huge fluctuations. And that's why I think, or I pray that long may this event stay at the Austin Country Club, because uh, that venue is just perfect for this place. You know, you, you play in the hills initially, and then you walk, work down the hill to alongside the Colorado River there. And it's just a great layout. And, and the way it, it flows for match play, I think, lends itself to a whole lot of fluctuation late in, in, in matches, which is cool. That Sergio Garcia group, that's group two with Colin Morikawa. That thing is wide open. Both Morikawa and Sergio Garcia, 1-0 oh, and 1. Kokrak is 1-1. One, and one. So Morikawa and Kokrak will play each other on Friday. There, there's a lot of scenarios in which that thing uh, goes to a sudden death playoff as well. Uh, big name goes down. Xander Shoffley in a back and forth match with Lucas Herbert. Xander falls because Herbert stuffs one close on 18, makes birdie on the last to steal the whole point. And now two and oh, the Australian in the driver's seat in group seven. Yeah, this one sort of chapped me a little bit because he was my one and done pick. Um, <laughs> but honestly, I thought Xander let him off the hook. Because Xander had that thing firmly in his grasp through 12 holes or whatever the case might have been. Mm -hmm. And then he made the bogey and you sort of let the competitor in. And then, you know, the difference between two holes and one hole up is big. You know, it's on the scorecard, it's just half, you would say. But when you win a hole back and all of a sudden you go from two down to one down, then you feel like there's life. And then, like I said, there's those closing stretch of holes where uh, Herbert made a few birdies. Like, I think it was three coming in and turned the tables on Xander. So, yeah, it was a great finish by Lucas. But honestly, the way he was playing uh, and the way Xander was playing, that was not the result that it should have been. So so Xander probably right now is ruining the way he closed that match out. I hate to further your chapped state over there, but my one and done selection got a free point today, Mark. Alex oh. Noren taking the concession <laughs> from Paul Casey. Thank you very much, Paul. I've always could I've always respected your insights and man I should have reached out to you because getting free points and things like this is a big deal especially in this round robin format which is pretty cool um you know it got a lot of 
a lot of um, criticism initially, but I think it's cool. You play three guys, it's round robin, you know, you got to grind it out three matches and then hopefully make it through. And there are no guarantees. There certainly are no guarantees. I mean, we've seen a number of upsets as you ordinarily do in this thing. Yeah, absolutely. And one final matchup here before we look at the odds board. Tommy Fleetwood gets the best of Scotty Scheffler, two and one. Scheffler, maybe one of the hottest golfers on the planet, went out and won his opening match. But uh, this is the first resistance he has seen. Still plenty up in the air for group five. That is a, a very difficult group, Mark. That's the Scheffler, Fleetwood, Fitzpatrick, Poulter group. So there's a lot to still be determined there. Yeah. Uh, you know, Scotty has been fantastic, but quietly Fleetwood's been good too. Um, he played well at the Arnold Palmer. I think he finished in the top 25. He, same sort of thing at the players. Valspar last week, he was a part of the story Sunday. Uh, you know, didn't finish well up the pack, but I think he was inside the top 20 there. And the game looked sharp. I mean, he's hitting the ball well again. He's making some putts, which is crucial. And remember, he was the guy. He was mammoth mm -hmm. in that Ryder Cup there at uh, Le Golf National outside of Paris when the Euros just drubbed the Americans. So he knows about match play, and he's a good player. And I think, you know, you talked about being, you talk about being chapped some. <laughs> he's largely been overlooked lately because he hasn't been playing that well. And he's fallen off people's radars. And, and these guys have egos, too. And so I'm sure he's like, enough of this already. I'm better than what my results have been showing. And this is the perfect format for me to now suddenly go in and do something special because you just got to beat the guy in front of you. And you do that five times in a row or six times, whatever it is. Um, and all of a sudden, you've got a whole heap of FedEx Cup points and a, and a lot of money and, and your season's changed. So uh, he doesn't really surprise me given what I'd seen the last few weeks and because we were covering him a bunch in feature groups for uh, ESPN+. Plus. If I'm correct on this, if Scotty Scheffler beats Matt Fitzpatrick on Friday and Tommy Fleetwood beats Ian Poulter on Friday, that would give us a three-way sudden death playoff between Scheffler, Fitzpatrick, and Fleetwood to determine group five. And Mark, that is a group that most people call the group of death. It might only be fitting that they go to a three-way playoff to determine the victor. Well, that would be cool. Um, I, I need you to help me on this one. Let's say two guys are tied at like two points or whatever. Mm -hmm. Is it a head-to-head -head record that determines that, or is it? I think is they it, did away uh, with that. They did away with that uh, a couple of years ago because uh, it, it de-incentivized some of the other results in in the matches. So now I'm I'm like almost positive everything goes to a sudden death. My guy's still alive. Then come on, Xander. He's still alive. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> very much alive. Yes, it, it would be. It would be cool to see that three-way playoff. Uh, and and they're such great personalities. There they are. And 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 you could throw a blanket over them. I mean, Fitzpatrick is he's like a little bulldog. Um, and he and he puts like a banshee. Fleetwood is a is a prolific ball striker. And Scotty is playing with heaps of confidence in his kind of back garden in a way. So. It's it's going to be fascinating, and 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 I'll be looking forward to seeing that one. Yeah, not often well, that you see a, a zero in the win column for Ian Poulter in match play, but that's what we've got with the the set of guys that he's got in Group Five. Well, this well I must say this about Poulter real fast because you know he's been so good in match play and in Ryder Cups and stuff that his reputation sort of precedes him a little bit, right? And uh, but the truth of it is is that he's now into his forties, some and, and and all the mental willpower in the world. Is, is it's not going it's only going to carry you that far um and then you you beat some you, you meet some guy who's playing well like a scheffler or a fleetwood or somebody and that's just a big ask for him now can he do it sure he's ian polter but he's had his share of wins in the past and i'm not closing the book on him but i'm saying you know when you see polter's name in a match play draw again i wouldn't call it the automatic victory that it might have been a few years ago yeah Fair enough. I want to look at the odds board with you here for just one second, Mark, but quick, we're going to take a, a short break and hear a word from our partners. The covenant will not stop. There is something within us, something sacred, something worth protecting. Silver chain on me.
And we're back. Uh, okay, Mark. So we've got a situation that is fascinating for day three of the WGC Dell Technologies match play. So obviously each one of these matchups has odds on it. You can bet either side. But as Jacob points out in our outline, there's kind of varying levels of motivation in round three just because of what we've seen over the first two rounds. For example, John Rahm is in. He's moving on. He's going to battle Patrick Reed on, on round three uh, with, with the outcome of the group already decided. I wonder if this is an opportunity to take the plus money on Patrick Reed. Would he be more incentivized than John Rahm, who's just out there for practice, knowing he's going to be into the Sweet 16? Uh, come on. Really? I, I tried. <laughs> I do not bet against John Rahm in matchups. Have no. you the laser look on this guy's face i'm just trying here mark no no yeah you know what there's an argument for it and i can see jacob's an intelligent guy and i can see maybe you know where he might be thinking that way but these guys have egos and they got a lot of pride and yeah i understand that maybe you want to toss a match if you're not that happy with your game but the last thing ron wants to do is get a loss in the column especially to patrick reed for pete's sake so no i mean i i, I think if ron had his druthers he would be putting a seven and six number on uh on Patrick Reed. So uh, he, you might want to entertain Reed, but Ram is just so stout a and he looks, and he looks good. You know, he had been less than convincing the last few weeks, I thought, and, and the performance on the greens wasn't caused to hit the panic button just yet, but it was a weakness. And um, the John Ram I've seen play granted, albeit it's just been a little bit this last couple of days is looking kind of like the John Ram we grew to uh, know and, and love over the last year and a half or so. Yeah, and uh, I, I do need to correct myself. Rom not technically through yet. Cam Young could tie him, so we're certainly going to get the full-on John Rom experience on Friday. Looking at some of these other matchups, Mark, we're going to get the ball-striking extraordinaires of Victor Hovland and Will Zalatoris. Victor Hovland, a small favorite in that match, but that is... That might be my favorite matchup that we are going that we're going to get tomorrow. Guy who wins that match is the guy who puts the least bad. <laughs> That's how it's going to go, because I mean, uh, over the last little while, I've seen Will on the greens and it hasn't been that great. And for the same package, um, Victor hasn't been that sharp either. I mean, I went with him when was it last week? Maybe in uh, in in one and done, which was a bit of a bust. But I just figured, okay, around. Um, Innersbrook, the, that copperhead course, the way he hits it, maybe the scoring will sort of stay a little high and he can get away with it a little bit, but it turned into a birdie fest. And so you had to putt. Now, the one thing I know about match play, 18 holes, you just got to make putts. That's how it is. And when you're in trouble, you got to make those crazy pars and, and keep the match um, within reach or, or out of the other player's hands. And and so that means it's a game of recovery too. So, so that match tomorrow, it's going to be fun to watch, but you might see guys making the other guy putt from inside of three feet every single time they ever won. Uh, that is certainly true. One more for me that has my attention, and I brought this up to Kyle last night. Brooks Kepka now 2-0. and Brooks Kepka in his post-round interview seems to be quite pleased with the state of his game. And Brooks Kepka is going to face Shane Lowry on Friday. And I just think it's a, a very different situation when Brooks Kepka gets to stare down the one guy that he's facing off against. It's not, it's not a leaderboard out in the distance. It's not a score that he has to post. It's this man standing right next to him. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, and, and that's really where he thrives when he can sort of, you know, out, out sort of maneuver you a little bit and, and, and out intimidate and, and intimidate you. So he gets the leg up some, but the one thing I know about Shane Lowry, he's he doesn't sort of go for that stuff he grew up playing golf with rory mcelroy okay and if anyone is a junior golfer was going to intimidate you it's rory and and if you used to ask larry about it he'd be like yeah you know he's great and he'd say that he goes no rory's awesome i want to be like rory and then he beats rory in the irish open to win as an amateur and stuff like that so 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 that's who larry larry is he's going to laugh about it some he's going to go and free wheel and he's been playing beautifully as well. So to me, of the two matches you list, I would sort of call that one the one I would probably stay tuned to. 
I cannot wait for day three when all of these groups get decided and all the sudden death and playoffs happen. Cannot wait for that moment. We'll be back after day three to break it all down. Mark, enjoy the vacation. It's well-deserved because when you get back, we're putting you right back to work. We've got a big event coming up. I'm not sure if you've heard about it. I'm ready, brother. I will be back. Uh, I think it's like next Friday or something. And then that Sunday morning, I'll be driving to Augusta National. So I'm, uh, well, I'll have my stuff going with me and I'm looking forward to it. All right. Very good. Mark Immelman, you can find on Twitter at Mark underscore Immelman. Producer Jacob does all the hard work behind the scenes. Thank you very much, Jacob. And you can find me at Rick Run Good. This has been the first cut and we'll catch you next time.